The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Do you live in constant anxiety, often fearing the worst? Katie Davis Majors opens up about a harrowing experience with her daughter. Myself and one of my adult daughters had jumped in the river to swim, and that's something we do a lot. It's not usually dangerous, but on this particular day, we got caught in this rapid, and it started taking us really quickly downstream, and I actually was able to get out, but I watched my daughter be swept around the corner. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Life Today. I'm Tammy Trent, and this is Randy Robison. Mm -hmm. So great to be back with you again. And our guest today, Katie Davis Majors, has an extraordinary story of how when God puts a dream on your heart and you chase after that to see what could actually happen. And I can't wait to talk to her about that today. Katie, welcome to Thank Life you. Today. Take us back. Like when I started digging into your story, like who is Katie Davis Majors? And something extraordinary to me happened to you when you were 19 years old. I mean, I think like this dream going on a mission field. I mean, who does that happen to at 19? But can you take us back? to that season in your life, for those yeah. that don't even know, like who is Katie Davis Majors and, and what really happened sure. in your life? <laughs> yeah, so I went on a mission trip with my mom to Uganda, a short-term trip my senior year in high school, okay. and just fell in love with the people, with the country. It's so beautiful there. Mm. The people are so kind and welcoming and hospitable. And we made friends with a pastor there who ran an orphanage, and he asked if I would be willing to come back for a year and work work with him and his wife at this orphanage that they ran. They were trying to start up a little preschool and kindergarten program. And at that time, I think I was like, I, I don't know. I'll think right. about it. I was a right. senior in high school. I had already applied and gotten into colleges. Wow. You know, I had plans to kind of stay on right. this specific track. Um, right. But I came back to the U.S. and spent my entire second semester just thinking about and dreaming about being back over in Uganda. Really? And so after I graduated from high school, I had committed to go and do a gap year with this okay. Ugandan family, a Ugandan pastor and his wife and their orphanage. I was gonna work there for a year. And so moved over there right before my 18th, or right before my 19th birthday, yeah. right at okay. 18 years old. And um, I lived with them in their home. They were super kind and gracious. They lived mm. in a little house and they had 120 kids that they were taking oh. care of and only about seven or eight staff. So super crowded, super busy. Um, and I just, you know, I began to fall in love with these kids and the majority of these kids in orphanages, they are not there because they have no one. They're there because their family doesn't have the financial ability to take care of them. Wow. And so I just was really sad yeah. the, for these kids, yeah. um, for their parents right. who I was getting to know that they didn't get yeah. to live together. The care at the orphanage was not phenomenal. I mean, it was pretty understaffed and mm. not very well funded. And so, um, I just began asking parents, would you, you know, would you want to have your kids at home if right. you could afford it? And a big hurdle for a lot of people was schooling. Um, was schooling is not free in Uganda and, um, even just the little bit, I mean, to us, it's not expensive at all, right? Maybe a couple hundred dollars a year, but that right. little bit was unaffordable okay. for many families in my community. And especially because many of them had, um, multiple children. And so they, they weren't able to pay for multiple children to go to school. And so, I mean, honestly, kind of on a whim. I mean, it wasn't a whim. It was the yeah. Lord's leading, but I offered to pay for these two little girls that girls. I had gotten to know. <laughs> I was like, I raised some money to be here for the year. Wow. Like, what if I pay for you two to go to school so that they could stay and live at home with their grandmother and not be at risk of coming to live in this institution? And yeah. So, you know, I called my parents and I'm telling my mom this story and she's like, oh, well, I, I want to pay for a kid to go to school. Do you know anybody else who needs to go to school? And I was like, yeah, our whole community <laughs> wow. is full yes. of school aged children who do, during the school day are sitting on the side of the road or are farming. They're not going to school. So sure, mom. Um, 
So I had some of my local friends help me start identifying children who were unable to afford to go to school. And, you know, my mom told her friends and my dad told his friends and my grandmother. And just kind of by word of mouth, I started raising money to send children to the local schools and within Within the first year of living there, I was just independently sending 40 kids mm. to school and right. um, meeting with them on the weekends. They were coming over on Saturday and we were doing Bible study and I was inviting their families over mm. and having these meals with them and um, developing these really, really meaningful relationships. And yeah. by the time my year was kind of coming to a close, I really felt that, no, this was going to be my life's work. And so mm. I uh, founded a nonprofit that I named Amazima. Okay. Amazima means truth in the native yes. language of Luganda because it was really my heart mm. that these kids would know the truth of yeah. Jesus and who yeah. he created them to yeah. be. And, um, so that, that's kind of the backstory yeah. and how it oh, all started. I love the backstory. And it, it, it just kind of like, could you see when you were there pouring into their lives, could you see like a change? Like these kids mm. are flourishing. They are hungry for the things of God and how exciting to be a part of that. And I think when you don't see the change, maybe you think, well, I'm not, maybe I'm not being effective enough. Could you see how effective this ministry was from the get-go for you oh, that made you want to stay yeah, in it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like God was just moving in such big and such miraculous ways for those early years. And the kids were so excited. They were excited to be in school. They were excited to learn the word of God. They were excited to learn anything. Um, and their parents too were coming to Christ and wow. were, um, we started doing like some little job training to try to help with the socioeconomic status of the parents and try to help them be more sustainable. And just, you know, I never, Amazima has grown tremendously. Now we have two different school campuses and okay. we've got, um, over 600 kids at each campus and it's just grown and grown. We have a staff of over 300 people. Oh and so, goodness. um, it's been fun to just look back over the years and think like, wow, I really never, I mean, I had no idea. I didn't right. plan any of this. Right. I didn't like sit down and write right. it out, but it just, it felt like, as I said, yes to one small step of obedience at a time, God just kept opening the doors wider and wider. And yeah. so, um, just a testimony of like what God can do yes. with an obedient heart mm -hmm. and just a willingness to, to put one foot in front of the other and do the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is not normal. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. And, and, yes. and it's fabulous. You listen to this and you go, oh, wow, what a wonderful thing. But I mean, you're, you're one person trying to help a, a problem that is bigger than yeah. just one village. That's I mean, right. bigger oh, than just yeah. one country. I mean, this is, this is a big thing. What, what made you think, did you ever think of it in those big terms? Or, you know, what made you think, yeah, I can do this and I can make a difference? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think really for me, I'm such a relational person and, and such like a, I don't always see real big picture. I think mm. for me, it was just really more this idea of like, okay, mm. you have a need and I have the ability to meet that. And I'm going to do that today. And yeah we'll see where that leads, right? And then tomorrow there was another need and it was always coming back and evaluating, okay, is this something that I can help with or not? Or if it isn't, can I call someone that I know who might be able to help with it? And just um, living in those small steps of obedience and saying yes to what I could say yes to and just wow. letting God kind of use that to do such a much bigger thing. That, that sounds a lot like a story I once heard uh, about some religious people that pass by someone in need, probably mm. with the idea of there's another one, mm. you know, yeah. there's, there's these people in need all over the place versus the one person who stopped and said, well, I mean, I can help this person. Right. They need my help and they're right in front of me. Right. Right. Did you feel God guiding you through this? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I absolutely felt that way. I don't think I ever felt like I'm going to solve the problem of, mm. you know, yeah. institutional care in East Africa, or I'm going to mm. solve the problem of education, but, but more just that God had given me a calling to love and serve the people in front of me. And mm. I was able to do that in small ways, right where I was. And a lot of people, um, kind of after that year and after I had written my first book and people became 
became more familiar with the story and I would get asked the question, like, how did you know? How did you know God was calling you to Uganda? And how did you know what his calling was? And I mean, quite honestly, like, I don't think I really did. I don't think there was ever this big moment of like, now you're going to spend the next 15 years of your life doing this. I think it was more like, okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And here I am in Uganda and this is how I'm going to do it today. And so that would be my encouragement to anybody who asks that question, like, where are you right now? Who are the people that God has put in your life and how how can you love them today? And who knows what that turns into down the road? I, you know, yeah. that's so that's so scriptural. I, I get mean, tired of the excuses. You know, yeah. why why are those people in that position? Uh, you know, why why are, why are they having more kids if they can't afford the kids? Right. Why are they? Why, like, can you help? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that attitude. Mm. Yeah. That's opened the world for you. Yeah. yeah. And Katie, like, when you talk about all of that too, Randy, and you you're thriving. You're thriving in the season of your life. Then COVID hits, mm. pandemic hits. You've had some highs. Have you gone through some lows? Have you been in a place where you're like, everything has shifted now. How do I navigate through this? And I'm sure if you're anything like me, what, when I'm going and, and I'm just yeah. hitting it hard for Jesus and I'm giving everything I've got and then I, ooh, I hit a wall. There can be times when the discouragement comes, mm-hmm. the questions come, you questioning yourself, questioning God's will. Am I in the right place now? What am I supposed to do with all of this yeah. right now, God? Um, and then anxiety. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people start fighting depression when everything shifts and changes. Did you ever go through a time like that, especially when the world changed? How did your oh, world change? Oh my goodness. Yes, it didn't we all. Absolutely. Yeah. I um I definitely have experienced all kinds of suffering has been mm. part of my story, a part of my family's story. Um, I, you know, I was in Uganda for over 15 years. Okay. I met my husband there. We got married. Um, I, we adopted 13 children, 13 Ugandan children. And then we also had two babies. So we've got a grand total wow. of 15 kids total. What are you, they're like not 21 now. They're, <laughs> like you're, you're they're, so not, they're not all kids now. They're okay. a lot of them are, are grown and they're in college and they're working, but, um, yeah. So obviously they all have come into our family with a different story that has a lot of suffering and heartache. And as a mom, I have carried that. Mm -hmm. We've had, of course, all kinds of friends, um, in our community in impossible situations, children who lost their parents because of HIV or tuberculosis or some other disease or illness that's really common in Uganda. And so a lot of our story was about walking with people through suffering. And then again, like you said, when the whole world shut down and everything shifted, we were actually in a position where Uganda locked its borders. Um, Nobody could come in and nobody could go out. And we had children who were already in the U.S. going to college here. But my anxiety just rose and rose and rose during that time, not knowing if my kids were safe and just feeling really trapped and stuck. And also watching the suffering of so many people in my community who didn't have access to the medical care that they needed and feeling scared in that way. And so that is definitely something that we experience. So talking personally, just to you right now, your book, Safe All Along, the subtitle, which is what grabs me, trading our fears and anxieties for God's unshakable Mm. peace. So many people are dealing with fears, with anxiety. You could speak to that because you were in that season of your Mm -hmm. life, worrying about your children, worrying about your future, the future of so many children in Uganda. How do we find God's peace in these crazy uncertain times, Mm. unshakable peace, the knowing that things can shift and change all around us, but God never changes. The peace of God is consistent. How do we find that? And how do people that are struggling to find that today, how did you find it? How could we help them find that Mm. in God's word? Yeah, so I did. I wrote this book, Safe All Along. Uh, Really, it's about my own journey and wrestle through that exact question is, God, I know that you promised me peace, right? Jesus says, peace, I leave you. Paul writes about um, a peace that passes understanding, but I'm like, I don't feel that. Right, exactly. Um, Especially when people I love are suffering. And God really gave me a picture Mm. as I struggled through my own anxiety. Mm. My um, 
our family had gone on a camping trip along the river, which is something we love to do as a family. And all of our kids are good swimmers. And um, myself and one of my adult daughters had jumped in the river to swim. And that's something we do a lot. It's not usually dangerous, but on this particular day, we got caught in this rapid and it started taking us really quickly downstream. And I actually was able to get out, but I watched my daughter be swept around the corner. And now she's super adventurous. So come to find out later, she was not panicking, but I was panicking. I was really, I mean, I thought we might lose her. Um, So scared, so anxious. She ended up getting out and being fine. But later that day, as I was kind of, you know, rehashing it to my husband, oh my goodness, I thought we were gonna lose her. He took me up on a hill where you could see the river from such a different perspective. You could see, you know, it looked small down there. You could see the whole thing and all the twists and turns and all the different places where we could have gotten to safety if she hadn't have gotten pulled out where she was. And I felt like God just spoke to me that that was a picture of a Mm. lot of the last couple years of my life that Mm. I had been so panicked and so anxious because all I could see was this, it was my little piece of it, right? That maybe my my loved ones weren't safe and maybe my friends and family members were going to get sick. Right. But, um, God sees that whole picture. And I feel like he just spoke over me. Like you can live in the peace of knowing that I see the whole thing and I promise to bring you safely through. And so in this world, we are going to have troubles. Jesus says it right in this world. You all have troubles, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so no matter what is going on around us, no matter what is causing our fear and anxiety, we know that we are safe in the loving hands of God who promises that he's going to bring us through to eternity with Amen. him. And we can look forward to that no matter yes. what. Amen. What a gift. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful illustration. Um, but you wrote a whole book on it. <laughs> so I'm yeah. guessing this was a, a pretty significant struggle for you for a while. Yes. Yeah. You still, do you still struggle at times with it? I, I mean, do. Because I mean, I'm, I think we all do, right? And I'm mm-hmm. quick to say to people, you know, I definitely didn't write this book like from the place of, and now I've overcome <laughs> right, and I never right. feel anxious anymore. Right. I'm definitely not mm. an expert, but God took me on a journey in writing this book and just asking him these questions. Mm. God, what? What does it mean? What does it look like to not just intellectually know Mm -hmm. that you are the Prince of Peace, but to actually deeply feel and know and walk in your peace and funny as it is. We had that, that moment with the river. He gave me that picture. I began to ask these questions and even write the outline for this book. And then unexpectedly, our family moved from Uganda to the United States. Um, there were a lot of different contributing factors. Some of our children were already over here in college. The COVID thing had been hard with the open and close and shut down and reopen cycles. Um, but we found ourselves, we were on a three week trip to visit some friends and family in the United States. We were here with all our kids and we actually decided to stay. Mm -hmm. And we felt like God was closing a lot of doors Mm -hmm. for us to go back to Uganda and opening a lot of doors for us to put down some roots here for a time. And that was both excruciatingly painful and very anxiety provoking. And I actually went back to my publisher and said, I don't know, I don't think that I can write a book about this. I'm still really struggling with this. But I had a really good friend say to me at that time, you know, people don't always want to learn from an expert. They yeah. want to learn from somebody yeah. who's really walking through it. And so I would say, yeah. like, absolutely, I still deal with anxiety. I still long to know how to live more deeply in the peace of God. But I think in writing this book, God gave me a lot of really practical ways. Yes, um, I noticed that. Yeah. To hold on to his peace and to walk in his peace, things that are simple, things that fit into my day as a busy mom. Um, And so I too am revisiting the Mm -hmm. book and trying to practice these things that I've written about. Wow. We didn't even have time to get into that. We're going to have to do another program with you because I think these practical steps really will Mm -hmm. help people. Request safe all along today when you help with the outreach. Um, But Tammy, there's a situation that we want people to know about right now where they can do something very practical to help. Absolutely. You take a minute, watch this, and we'll be back to tell you how you can help. 
Water sources for over 700 million people worldwide are not safe. Sickness and death result from drinking contaminated water like this. Yet mothers like Yolok continue to collect it for their families. So why do you drink it? I have no other choice is something every mother like Rhoda lives with, and it stands as a painful reminder for her of her losses because of this contaminated water. Stories like these represent a snapshot of what mothers around the world are faced with. But it doesn't have to remain like this simply because they have no other choice. This is the water sources for this village and so many other villages just like it all over the world. And it can't keep happening. Those of us who can have got to get involved. We've got to care enough to make a difference in water, the water crisis around the world. And it doesn't have to be that way. Help us give water for life. I have no other choice, she said. You know, I know that her pain is real when she says that she was right there, that same room when her daughter died. But the hospital was too far away. So she didn't have options. She didn't have a choice but to give that baby that water. You saw it in the video. And probably many of you were like, I cannot believe anybody is drinking that kind of water. But hundreds of thousands right now are. And it is their only option. It is their only choice. They don't have another choice. It rips me up inside to think that that's the condition they're living under. And yet knowing that there's a solution. We have been drilling water wells for many, many years. We know how to go in and we know how to lift her pain, we know how to bring her hope. We have a solution to do that and to go into that village, drill a well that will provide clean water for over a thousand for a lifetime. Can you imagine? We could change it like that together. And I think Randy, as we join together today, knowing that $4,800 to go in there and put in a whole well, I mean, to me, that's not a lot of money that could change the lives of so many people. Well, it works when we all come together. Right. When when many of us participate, because we can't all just, you know, drill a well on our own. Some of you can, and I would ask you to do that. But we can come together in numbers, and then mm -hmm. that's when it becomes very practical, yes. very simple, which is yeah. why our goal this year is to go into 20 nations and drill 350 wells. I would love to surpass that, mm -hmm. but that's that's our goal. That's our commitment for the year. The way that breaks down is, is a gift of $48 today would provide clean drinking water for, on average, a well lasts about 70 years, which is pretty close to the average expected lifetime. So 10 people will get clean water for a lifetime with a gift of $48. Mm -hmm. It's it's. That's the simplicity of right, it. Right. The complexity of it is is that it's very hard for us in developed countries to imagine that you know maybe you couldn't just move or mm. go somewhere else or find water somewhere else, but mm. that's just not the reality around the world. There are situations where people have been pushed out of their homes, their their crops have failed, so they've, they've had to go somewhere else. It's unseasonably hot and dry. There are situations that arise that are completely out of the control of these people. What do we have control over? You and I coming together, mm -hmm. saying, let's do something about it. Let's yeah. go put a water well right there. And we've seen this many times across the world where we go in, we drill a well, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. We have that power to do that today if we will come together. Will you go online or go to the phone right now 
make whatever gift you can. Every little bit helps. There's not too little and there's not too much. Maybe you can give a whole well today. Whatever you can do, I pray you'll do it right now. Every day, thousands of lives are lost to waterborne disease, and nearly half of those are children under the age of five. Through Mission Water for Life, you can give mothers hope and children a future as we provide clean, life-giving water for thousands of children and their families before it's too late. With your gift today, you can help drill and establish 350 water wells this year. Your gift of $24 will help provide clean water for five children. A gift of $48 will help provide for 10. $72 will provide for 15. And $144 will help provide life-giving water for 30 people for a lifetime. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you the Life Prayer Journal, complete with customized art, scripture verses, and inspirational quotes from Life Today hosts and co-hosts. You'll find plenty of room to write down prayer requests, answered prayers, and your own personal reflections as you spend time with God. With your gift of $100 or more, please request the Blessed Cutting Board, a beautiful addition to your kitchen and preparation area. This pine wood cutting board is custom engraved with the word blessed as a reminder of the daily provision of God in your life. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide for 250 people or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well. And you may request our colorful bronze sculpture, Consider the Birds. Please call, write, or make your gift online. Do call or go online, make the best gift you can. You can do something today and it will save lives. So I pray you'll do that. When you do, feel free to request Safe All Along by Katie Davis Majors, a wonderful book. And Katie, I'm, I've got my list of nine practical things to fight the anxiety. Uh, you can do another program tomorrow and we can talk about this. Awesome. She's got a lot to tell us. It's we have good. a lot to learn. Yes, we do. Katie, thank you so much for being yeah, here. What a thank joy. You. You're adorable. Can I use that word? You're <laughs> adorable. So. And you are a godsend. Mm. We appreciate you so much. Thank you very thank much. You. Can't wait to talk to you tomorrow. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time on Life Today. Tomorrow, missionary and author Katie Davis Majors teaches us how to start trading our fears and anxieties for God's unshakable peace. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.